Hey everyone, welcome back. This is week six of Our Mothers Knew It, and our first week in Second Nephi. So this week we only have two chapters to study. <laughs> I have to tell you in full honesty, when I figured that out at the end of last week, I was like, yes, this week I'm going to get so far ahead. I had this grand plan, you guys. And then it turns out the doctrine that we study in these two chapters is so rich and so dense that you can't cruise through it very well. It's simple and plain and precious, but it is... It is worth taking time over. There's a reason there are 30 plus pages of notes this week to study because there's there are boatloads from modern day prophets and apostles who comment on these verses and why they matter so much. So what you're going to study this week in these first two chapters, you're going to see this next era open up. So where they arrived at the promised land and they're starting to thrive. Now you're going to see the end of Lehi's life and what he as a prophet wants to give them at the end of his life. He wants to leave behind his witness of the Savior, and he does it in this incredible way. You know, he pulls each of his family members aside, he talks to them, he encourages them, he even corrects them at times, and you just hear him pleading. He almost feels like, I mean, I guess he is a patriarch, but you know, when you approach a patriarch for your patriarchal blessing, you feel like they have sight that is so much bigger. I remember feeling that I got my blessing when I was 16, and I wasn't perfect by any stretch, and I remember almost being afraid when I sat down in that chair that he was going to like see right through me or something. And what I found is he saw bigger, you know, where I could see myself as this 16 year old, you know, mistake ridden kid, he saw bigger and he wanted me to see bigger. And that's what I think Lehi does in these chapters as well. He wants his sons to remember who they are, to live up to their privileges and to grab hold of truth. So he's going to teach those core fundamentals that we still study in depth all the time. He's going to teach them about agency. He's going to teach them about the creation, the fall, and the redemption of the Messiah. And he's just going to do it beautifully. I just think his way, not just his words, but his whole heart is in this message. And it it will resonate as you study it this week. You're you're in for a treat. You guys, you're going to love this week of study. The biggest thing I found that I loved throughout all the chapters is that there is this invitation to not just expect the reward at the end, but to live as though today. To me, it was the same message we heard from President Nelson at conference, where he basically was trying to teach us that God's plan is fabulous. In fact, I almost could hear Lehi saying those words this week. His plan is fabulous and expertly crafted to create joy. He wants us to be home. He wants us to feel joy. And there is one way to get there. And he has, he has created it for us. It's just beautiful. So grab your scriptures, grab your notes. It's time to get started. All right, let's get started on our seven sparks. So spark number one, something that caught my eye that then I dove deeper to try and find out what it might mean and why the spirit was like intriguing me with it. I call this one get out of the poppy field, but let me give you some context. Right now, Sam is in a musical for his middle school. He's It's Wizard of Oz. Sam is a munchkin. And so I think I've got that in my brain already. So when I went into my scriptures this week, I started to see the Wizard of Oz in my scriptures. I think this is how the Spirit teaches me all the time. Like he takes my normal everyday circumstances and he tries to teach me true eternal principles in them. So for this one, the visual that hit me as I was studying Lehi, because basically he's going to start chapter one with guidance about the promised land. He's going to remind his sons, not just Laman and Lemuel, but all his sons, that this is a land of promise, that it is a land that is created so that men can have agency and understanding and make choices to turn to God. That's why it's this beautiful land for them to inhabit. And then he turns to them and asks them to awake and arise. And the visual that hit me was the Wizard of Oz, because you know that scene? I mean, if you picture the old movie, you can they're almost to the Emerald City. They've gone days trying to get to this one location, and they can see it in the distance. And then there's this field of poppies that's been bewitched. And in the process of traipsing through this field, they become sedated, basically. You know, like they first kind of slow down and then they start to feel tired and then they sit down and then eventually they lay down in this field and it becomes this trap. What seemed like a path towards freedom and joy and happiness ends up becoming this trap. And I feel like that's what Lehi can see in his sons. He can see that some of his sons are enjoying the freedoms that come with being obedient to God's laws, and some of his sons are 
in chains and he wants them to shake them off. I just think he can't like lift them out of the poppy field. He can't, he can't shock them with an antidote. All he can do is try to help them remember truth and hope that that truth holds on. What I love is you actually see the same pattern throughout the Book of Mormon. You're going to see this with Enos. He remembers the words of his father and it helps him grab hold of his testimony. Alma the Younger says a similar situation. He vastly different life experiences than Enos probably, but Alma the Younger remembers the words of his father and he grabs hold to that promise of the Savior. I feel like that's what Lehi is trying to do here. He's saying, of all the things I could teach you about, please grab hold of this truth. And then he asks them to awake. So if you look in the verses, this is 2 Nephi 1, 13 and 14, and then again in 21. It says, oh, that ye would awake from a deep sleep, yea, even from the sleep of hell, and shake off the awful chains by which ye are bound, which are the chains which bind the children of men, that they are carried away captive down to the gulf of misery and endless woe. Awake and arise from the dust, and hear the words of a trembling parent. Then if you go into 21, he says, and now that my soul might have joy in you, that my heart might leave this world with gladness because of you, that I might not be brought down with grief and sorrow to the grave, arise from the dust and be men. And be determined in one mind and in one heart, unified in all things, that ye may not come down into captivity. Awake, my sons, put on the armor of righteousness, shake off the chains by which ye are bound, and come forth out of obscurity, arise from the dust. It's this, you know, like pep talk of, I can't push you out of this field, I need you to stand. You see that same thing in The Wizard of Oz, or if you've ever seen somebody on one of those movies where somebody's struggling with hypothermia, it's like, they, you can't sit down, you can't stop, you can't rest, you need to keep moving so your body can circulate. That's the same idea here, he's like awake. What I love is that pattern that he gives you in 21. That's what sparked for me. Because basically I think he's giving you some key ways to stay awake in a giant poppy field world, <laughs> you know, like this world that's full of spiritual sedatives that will dull you and numb you from the promptings of the spirit. And so he gives you these pro tips and I love them. So first he says, awake. To me, this is not just like be aware of what's happening around you, but stop being a victim. You know, don't feel like you are just you're at the mercy of your circumstances. Choose to proactively be men choose to hold tight to the rod. Make those conscious choices. And as you do, your power flows into you. That's what I feel like he's trying to do. What's interesting is you see this problem happen with Laman and Lemuel's descendants, where they feel like they aren't agents, that they are victims. I feel like you see this a lot in our world today. I, there's this entitlement to this victim mentality where they at least in the Book of Mormon, they feel like Nephi was the bad guy, that he stole the birthright, that he kept things like the Liahona and the Sword of Laban and other things from them. And so they feel like this victim mentality. And I feel like ne Lehi is trying to help them understand to awake means to choose, to take your circumstances and realize that freedom comes in choosing how you respond to your circumstances. So his first big message is awake. And then he says, arise. To me, this is, I think he's trying to help his sons realize you still have strength in your legs. One of the most sinister parts of the adversary's plan is he likes to make you think that it's too hard to stand. That yes, you had these privileges before and you fell below them and the distance between where you are now and where you should have been is just too vast. And I feel like what Lehi is going to tell his sons over and over again this week is, you have strength you don't understand. If you tap into the atonement of Jesus Christ, you will have the power to arise. There is strength in those muscles. Put them to the test. Arise. And then the third one, be determined in one mind and in one heart. What gets Laman and Lemuel into trouble all the time, we've already seen it in First Nephi, is that they want to serve two masters. You know, They want to keep one foot in Jerusalem and then the other one following the prophet on the way to the promised land. You, know, you see them just split They'll, they'll be following the prophet and honoring what he's saying. And then the next day, go back to saying, well, we would have been better off had we stayed. So he's just trying to help them see like, no, I need you focused. Freedom comes in the focus. Freedom comes when you set aside all these other worldly temptations and you say, I'm all in. That's where you find liberty that is real and lasting. And then the next one, shake off the chains. I just feel like this is his way of trying to help them understand it's easier than you think. We're going to talk about this in the object lessons too, but the idea that you can shake chains off, 
You don't have to wait for someone to unlock it. You don't like you can shake these things off. The addictions you have, the habits you have, the murmuring tendencies you've seem to be carrying with you all the time. Those are things that can be shaken off, especially when you have the power of the Lord on your side. That increases your strength and you're able to shake them. The same way Nephi was able to get those bands to be loosed. I feel like the chains of hell are not as strong as the Satan would like us to think they are. And I think that's what Lehi wants his sons to understand. And then the last one is he invites them to come out of obscurity. To me, this is him saying, you're not going to be able to stay strong if you stay in that poppy field. <laughs> they, when you watch the Wizard of Oz, they like run out of that field because they know how toxic it is. Once they finally awake and they finally come to their senses, they're like, we got to go and we got to go fast. And that's what I feel like Lehi is trying to say to his sons too. When you come to that realization that there needs to be change, don't linger, don't wait, don't debate and don't procrastinate, jump, hold and book it out of that field because that's where power comes when you get out of that seed bed of temptation and you head onto that right road. Freedom is found there. And I feel like that's one of my favorite parts of this week's study. Spark number two, I call how to tremble well, because I think Lehi is a rock star this week. I just love his stance. He has this, I mean, he's at the end of his life. We don't know why he's at the end of his life. If this is just age hitting, maybe a lot of time has passed in these intervening chapters, or maybe what happened on the boat last week when we were studying, you know, remember they talked about how he got so sick and his wife got so sick that they almost died you know, their sons delayed their repentance long enough that it caused all these ramifications for others. And one of the ramifications was that Lehi and Sariah got very weak. And part of me wonders if they just never quite recovered. You know, if they're like this visible evidence to everybody there about the risks of procrastinating your repentance. I don't know, but it must have been hard to see. I just think there's something powerful about his trembling for me. It talks about him as a trembling parent. So if you look in verse 14, it says, Awake and arise from the dust and hear the words of a trembling parent, whose limbs ye must soon lay down in the cold and silent grave, from whence no traveler can return. A few days more, and I go the way of all the earth. And then 15, But behold, the Lord hath redeemed my soul from hell. I have beheld his glory, and I am encircled about eternally in the arms of his love. Nephi or Lehi in this moment is not trembling because he's afraid. You know, he knows death is right there. It, he's about to cross over and he is not afraid of that. <laughs> he's not afraid of the crossing. What he's afraid for, I think, or why he trembles, either it's his physical ailments from what happened or just the fact that he is trying so, he wants to powerfully witness to his sons how important choice is. And so he's going to teach them powerfully. And I wonder if it's one of those kind of trembles where it's like he, he's speaking and his whole body is trying to get this message across. But what I love is his stance. In 15, he says, I am encircled. This is not, he's not testifying to his sons that he knows he's going to cross over the veil and soon he'll be encircled. What he's saying is, right now I know I am encircled. In fact, I've always been encircled. I love that in 15, he says, the Lord hath redeemed my soul from hell now. You know, the now is implied. He, he feels confidence in the present tense, not just in the future. What I like about that for us is, I think sometimes it's tempting to see, well, to think we're not sure how the Lord feels about us and we won't know for sure until we get to the judgment bar. I just don't think that's the gospel, you guys. I think we're supposed to approach every single day and come to the Lord and find out how does he feel about us? You know, I know he always loves us, but how are we doing? And are there areas I need to improve and work on? And that allows you to approach with confidence that no matter when the end of my life comes, I can approach the throne of God boldly because I know where my heart has been and I know what I've tried to do and the knowledge I've tried to live up to. That's the promise. And I just think it's powerful. When I first read it from Lehi, I thought, well, of course he has this stance. You know, he's kind of like a President Nelson. <laughs> like he, he's lived a good life all his life. He's lived in the service of God and he's done everything he can and made huge sacrifices. So of course, at the end of his life, He's going to sort of have his calling and election made sure, you know, like he's going to know he's in good standing. The reason this opened up for me when I was studying is because of what I read in chapter two. What's fascinating to me is that when you get to two, he's talking to his young son. So this is Jacob, the son who was born in the wilderness, meaning he can't be more than like a dozen years old, maybe, you know, on, on the boat, he was the one that was at risk because his mother was sick and therefore he was at risk. So I can't imagine Jacob is very old. And somehow, Lehi says the same sort of words to Jacob, that he is 
He's not worried for him. He knows he is safe. So if you look in 2 Nephi 2, this is 3 and 4. Wherefore, thy soul, this is talking to Jacob, thy soul shall be blessed, and thou shalt dwell safely with thy brother Nephi, and thy days shall be spent in the service of God. Wherefore, I know that thou art redeemed because of the righteousness of thy Redeemer. For thou hast beheld that in the fullness of time he cometh to bring salvation unto men. That's what it means to have confidence in Christ. He he believes in Jacob. He knows what Jacob understands. He knows Jacob has seen the Lord. He's had experiences that will root him. And if he stays on that path, here's these promises. I just think it's it's the confidence we're all supposed to have. There's this beautiful talk. Um, I stumbled on it maybe six or eight months ago. I was giving a talk to a group of women and they asked me to speak about having confidence in Christ. And so this is a conference talk that just lit up for me as I was studying that. And I think it applies here, especially with what Lehi is trying to teach his sons. It's from Elder Klebengat. It's from October, 2014. You can find it in the notes, but I loved his stance. Basically, he starts the talk by saying, I want you to imagine that you have an interview with Heavenly Father, that you have to walk into the room with Jesus Christ. And how would you feel? You know, he's saying, if you're at the end of your life and you have to talk with Jesus Christ, how do you feel going into that interview? And he asks you to kind of self-evaluate. He's like, would you hang at the door? Would you be nervous to go in? Would you approach the throne of God boldly? And then he gives you all these tips. I think there's six in the talk. He outlines some ways that you can come boldly to the throne of grace. But what I loved is his last couple paragraphs. This is where he ties it all together and invites us to have this stance of confidence in Christ in our everyday life. So he says, no matter what your current status, the very moment you voluntarily choose honest, joyful, daily repentance by striving to simply do and be your very best, the Savior's atonement envelops and follows you as it were, wherever you go. Living in this manner, you can truly always retain a remission of your sins every hour of every day, every second of every minute, and thus can be fully clean and acceptable before God all the time. Yours is the privilege, if you want it, to come to know for yourself today or soon that you are pleasing God in spite of your shortcomings. And then at the end, he bears this testimony that he, we all can get to this point where we can wax confident. You know, we, we can confidently approach because we know the goodness of God. We know our heart's desire. We know what we've tried to do. We know th- what we've accomplished so far. And we know that abounding grace of God and that it is that grace that will save us and that we can have confidence in it. To me, that was just powerful. It allows me to tremble for my kids. It allows me to tremble for the circumstances I can't control, but it allows me to feel peace and assurance about myself. I feel like the checklist he gave me helped me focus on what I'm doing today and how the Lord feels about me today. And I think it's a his talk will help you, at least to help me. I feel like it was a way to self-evaluate and figure out how I could move forward in faith, the same way Lehi was encouraging his son Jacob to go forward in faith. I call this third spark forged in fire, because this is where we shift into chapter two, and Lehi is talking to his son Jacob. So Jacob's got an interesting backstory, right? He's born in the wilderness. He's never seen Jerusalem, at least not with his natural eyes. He doesn't have the same pull that Laman and Lemuel feel to go back home. And so he has a different sort of upbringing. He also experiences a lot of hardship because of his upbringing. You know, not just the fact that they journeyed through wilderness for probably his whole lifetime, but that he is somebody who has experienced his brothers firsthand. Lehi will draw attention to that. He talks about the rudeness of his brothers and how it impacts Jacob. So if you look in verses one and two of 2 Nephi 2, it says, and now Jacob, I speak unto you, Thou art my firstborn in the days of my tribulation in the wilderness. And behold, in thy childhood thou hast suffered afflictions and much sorrow because of the rudeness of thy brethren. Nevertheless, Jacob, thy, my firstborn in the wilderness, thou knowest the greatness of God, and he shall consecrate thine afflictions for thy gain. I feel like where we saw last week that Lehi had that moment where he blamed God for the trials they were enduring. Remember when the bow breaks and Lehi blames God? And we talked about in last week's insights about how in my perspective anyway, this could be a a righteous blame. This could be Lehi saying something like, well, this is just what God wanted for us. And I feel like now he's kind of progressed beyond that. Now he's saying like, we know exactly why you've experienced afflictions. It's not because God wanted you to experience afflictions as much as it is your brothers are rude sometimes. This is a hard world to live in. And I feel like what he's saying is, where do you 
do with that? What are you going to take from it and move forward? If you can trust in the goodness of God, then you don't need to be afraid of being impacted by others' agency. So that's what he asked him. He's like, you have to trust that he will consecrate your afflictions for your gain. The reason I like that so much, and we've talked about this many times in the past, is I just think this is one of the hardest parts of mortality, <laughs> that not everything is up to us. You know, we have this beautiful gift of moral agency, but sometimes it's other people's moral agency that rams us. You know, I always call these intersections of agency because you can be on the right track and then feel like someone else's choices just like ram you off course. And it's not fair because you were on the right track. And I just think it's really easy in those moments to blame God or to get bitter and resentful and think, well, now how am I supposed to be successful? And I feel like Lehi is he sees that with Jacob and he's saying, I want you to focus on what you can control. You can control your connection to God and therefore you're going to be just fine. He can use all these things and consecrate them for your good. So if you look in 11, this is when he teaches Jacob specifically about opposition. For it must needs be, this is 11 and 12, for it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. If not so, my firstborn in the wilderness, righteousness could not be brought to pass. Neither wickedness, neither holiness, nor misery, neither good nor bad. Wherefore, all things must be a compound in one. Wherefore, it should be one body. It needs be, it, if it should be one body, it must needs remain as dead, having no life, neither death, nor corruption, nor incorruption, happiness, nor misery, neither sense, nor insensibility. I really like that phrase, compound in one. Because for me, I feel like what Lehi is trying to teach his son is you have to take the good with the bad. You're going to experience hard things. This world is designed to give us hard things so that we grow and become like our Father in heaven. In addition to that, there is also good that comes from it. Because Jacob is soft and humble, you know, probably because of the rudeness of his brethren where he's had to turn in a lot and he's had to pray for help a lot. He's also been able to come close to the Lord. And we know that he actually gets to see Jesus Christ before before his mortal ministry. He gets to experience the Savior in a way that he couldn't have otherwise. So for me, that's what compound in one means. I think he's trying to say to him, mortality is a mixed bag and you just have to trust that all things are in the Lord's hands. So when you get rammed with someone else's agency, trust that he can find a way to make all things work together for your good. That's his promise. If you look in 12, it says, wherefore it must needs have been created for a thing of naught. Wherefore, if there could have been no purpose in the end of its creation, wherefore this thing must needs destroy the wisdom of God and his eternal purposes and also the power and the mercy and the justice of God. There has to be opposition. Opposition isn't always just a, you know, black and white, good and evil. Opposition just means choices. There has to be a myriad of experiences for you to learn from and react to. And so that's what he's promising him. I really think it's powerful to see how our modern prophets and apostles teach this today. And I got to tell you, one of my favorites of all time is from Elder Rendlin. This is his talk about infuriating unfairness. If you feel those pulls, like Jacob has every right to feel for the rudeness of his brethren, and you're struggling, you should go back and read this talk. Let me just give you a little excerpt that I love. He says, in mortality, we can come boldly to the Savior and receive compassion, healing, and help. Even while we suffer inexplicably, God can bless us in simple, ordinary, and significant ways. As we learn to recognize these blessings, our trust in God will increase. In the eternities, Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ resolve all unfairness. We understandably want to know how and when. <laughs> how are they going to do that? When are they going to do it? To my knowledge, they have not revealed how or when. What I do know is that they will. That's Elder Renlund's promise. That's Lehi's promise to Jacob. He's saying, you are not a victim here. Other people's agency ramming into you never sets you off course as long as you are on the path of God. You stay riveted on that tree and you keep going and you will be okay. And that's the peace I felt. Another talk I loved, I don't have time to give you the full talk, but this is a BYU devotional from Elder Christofferson. He has two devotionals on moral agency that I just loved. You can find them in the notes, but he quoted a professor in his talk that was kind of talking about when people approach you and say, how could a loving God let so many of his children suffer? That kind of perspective. And he tied it to agents in a way that I just thought was beautiful. So he says, Professor C. Terry Warner stated, human agency was purchased with the price of Christ's suffering. This means that to those who blame God for allowing human suffering, Latter-day Saints can respond that suffering is less important than the gift of agency, upon which everything else depends, and that none of us have paid a greater price for this gift than Christ. I 
think that's his, that's Lehi's wish for Jacob. Don't wallow. Don't get stuck in this stance where you have every right to be a victim and to feel abused. Take a stance of strength. Connect with the Lord and trust that he can make all things work together for your good. Trust that the agency you've been granted is worth the price. It was worth it from the beginning. It is still worth it today and move forward in faith. Over and over again in scripture, we're encouraged to allow our hearts to break, <laughs> to be brokenhearted and have a contrite spirit. You're going to see that in chapter two this week. This is when Lehi is trying to teach Jacob, especially about the stance of humility that he's going to need. To me, this is Jacob understanding his son's future a little bit. The same way I think the patriarch who put his hands on my head could see things in my future that I couldn't see, that I could choose to live up to those privileges if I if I followed the course that he lays out for me. I think Lehi's in that same sort of stance, because just in a few chapters, we're going to see after the Lamanites and the Nephites divide and Nephi establishes a temple in the land, Jacob is basically made the high priest of that temple. And Jacob didn't know the old temple in Jerusalem. What he knows is the scriptures. I think it maybe is one of the reasons why he's called to be the high priest, because he's not someone who's going to pull from the old ways. He's going to fulfill, he's going to establish the law of Moses in a righteous way in their temple. Uh, they talk about living the law of Moses until the Savior comes. And I think Jacob can do that with fresh eyes. And, and he, he does, right? And I think Lehi can see that in his son. And so he wants to prepare him, which is why I think so much of chapter two is focused on those same fundamentals that you learn about in the temple today. You know, he talks about worthiness. He talks about sacrifice, what sacrifice should look like. He talks about creation and fall and atonement. All those things are in chapter two. And for me, I feel like this is Lehi the patriarch saying, let me help prepare you for the calling that I see coming your way. And since I know I can trust your heart, this calling is going to happen and let me, let me prepare you. I just think there's such beautiful flow to it. So you'll find these verses. This, it begins around verse 6 of chapter 2. He talks about, Wherefore redemption cometh in and through the holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Wherefore, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth, that they may know that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah, who layeth down his life according to the flesh and taketh it again by the power of the Spirit, that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, being the first that should rise." I love that Lehi puts this big spotlight on sacrifice. Not that there wasn't an emphasis on sacrifice in the Jerusalem temple, but things had become a bit distorted with their sacrifices. And Lehi wants Jacob, I think, to know that when they offer these animal sacrifices to the Lord, the focus has to be on the state of your heart. That's, it's supposed to, all these, all these sacrifices are supposed to direct our eyes forward to the offering of the Savior when he offers himself as this great and last sacrifice. So I feel like this is Lehi trying to say, make sure that as you prepare, you study these things, understand what sacrifice looks like. The reason I love that phrase, broken heart and contrite spirit, I just think it's a stance of humility. For me, we talked about this before, but I really feel like broken heart just means broken open. I always picture a seed or a loaf of bread broken open, like in order to give itself the ability it needs. It has to break open. When you think about a seed, when the, the, those shells fall off and this new plant emerges, that's what a broken heart looks like to me. It is, I'm going to let this natural man part of me slough off so that something better can emerge. And it's going to be awkward and I'm going to make mistakes, but I'm, it's worth it. You know, like, that's the promise. Like there's so much more to me than just this little seed. I love, I remember when we were in the Doctrine and Covenants, when we talked about apples and seeds and this idea of like how many seeds are in one apple. And then you have to try and figure out how many apples are in one seed. I just think that's what Lehi is trying to get Jacob and all his sons to grasp. Like don't just live small. Let your natural man self break open so that you can grow and you can change and you can advance. You can be everlasting. That's his, his imitation. My favorite talk from about this area is from Elder Porter. So this is Susan Porter's late husband, and I love his talks. If you go back in the notes, you can see one, but he talks about how Christ is the ultimate example of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. 
which was fascinating to me, you guys, because I always think of broken heart and contrite spirit in association with repentance and, you know, fixing damage. And I think if the Savior is the epitome of a broken heart and a contrite spirit, it means there's much more to this than that. And what Elder Porter clarified for me is that it means offering your will to God. That's a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So if you look in his, you can see the full quote in the notes, but let me give you just a snippet. He says, as in all things, the Savior's life offers us the perfect example. Though Jesus of Nazareth was utterly without sin, he walked through life with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, as manifested by his submission to the will of the Father. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. To his disciples he said, Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And when the time came to pay the ultimate sacrifice entailed in the atonement, Christ shrank not to partake of the bitter cup, but submitted completely to his Father's will. The Savior is our perfect example of a broken heart and a contrite spirit, but he is one who lived joyfully. I think to live in this constant state of brokenness is not to live sad. It's to live humbly and eagerly, like hopefully that if you put your will in his hands, he can make so much more of your life than you could do on your own. I just think that's part of the promise. In fact, at the end of that same talk from Elder Porter, he highlighted this one verse in Isaiah and It just tied all of this doctrine in a beautiful bow for me. This is Isaiah 61, 1. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. You can read Abinadi's words. He says something really similar, but that idea of being bound up, choosing to be broken so that something new can emerge, something better and glorious and more lasting, and then allowing yourself to be bound up by him. You know, he is someone who binds broken hearts. He lived his life to exemplify it for us, and he offered his atonement to give us that gift. We are not intended to be broken. We are intended to be progressing, and we need him in order to do it. Towards the middle of chapter two, Lehi changes his focus a little bit rather than speaking just to Jacob. Now he's speaking to everybody and he teaches them about the plan of salvation. And then he uses the example of the Garden of Eden. What's interesting to me is I think he's trying to help his kids see that Adam and Eve are someone who chose to use their moral agency for good and that we can follow their lead. We can see their story and see God's hand in it and how he set them up to make good choices and to allow the fall to happen, that we should see that as a template so that then we can trust in God, that we can trust that the opposition we face and the adversities we're dealing with, that we can choose good just like our first parents did. For me, that's why he incorporates this story. In addition to the fact that I think he's trying to help Jacob focus the temple and make it better, I think he's also trying to help us better because he teaches about that first beginning. So if you look in 2 Nephi 2, this 14 through 16, And now, my sons, I speak unto you these things for your profit and learning. For there is a God, and he hath created all things, both the heavens and the earth, and all things that in them are, both things to act and to be acted upon. So he's saying he made two different kinds of things, things that are going to be acted upon, like objects you would hold, and then things to act, that all of us are things to act. If you don't hear Elder Bednar just ringing in your ears right now, because I feel like so many of his talks are about using our moral agency and being agents to act. That's, for me, what you feel in these verses. If you go in 15, it comes out even louder. And and to bring about his eternal purposes in the end of man, after he created our first parents and the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, and in vine all things were created, it must needs be that there was an opposition, even a forbidden fruit in opposition to the tree of life, the one being sweet and the other bitter. This is Lehi trying to clarify that God has a clear purpose. His clear purpose is not that we all just get back to heaven. He wants us to have an eternal life. Sometimes when you think the phrase eternal life, you just think it goes on forever. And I think eternal life is so much richer than that. Eternal life is a God-like life that you will have his capabilities to love, his capabilities to understand, you know, like you will be able to create. He wants you to have a God-like life. That's eternal life. So he needs us to become something. So the way he phrases it here, he's saying, because God has that end in mind, that we become as he is, he set up this course for Adam and Eve. He created them, he created all things around them, and he created opposition. And it's going to be hard in the amount of time that we have to articulate how much I learned about the fall this week. I just think 
it's such a fabulous plan. You know, the more you study it, the more you dive deep, you can go into the notes and learn a lot more. But God's way of providing them choices, you know, providing them these trees and helping them see clearly what what they can choose, I just think is incredible. Honestly, you'll get it more fully when we hear Jacob teach this in a few weeks. So I'm not going to go too deep now, but I just think the Lord is trying to clarify to Adam and Eve how much he respects them. You know, remember how we talked about over and over again that the Lord always gives dignity, that the priesthood is given in order to dignify and remind people that who they really are. I just think that's what he does here with Adam and Eve. He he gives them dignity by giving them agency because he trusts that they are the kind of souls who will choose good. We were given agency not as a right, but as a gift so that we could choose good. But in order for us to make a choice, we have to have other options. So we're going to go through this in the object lessons as well. But I think you can actually take those same principles and apply them to this first parent's story. You can see where he gives them clear laws to follow. You can see where he gives them choices to choose from, not just these two trees, but a whole garden full of trees that they can eat from. They have choices. They're not put at a point where they have to pick one or the other. They have choices and they have time to process things. He also, agency doesn't apply for us unless we have education and understanding. So I feel like you see that in the Garden of Eden. A lot of this comes from more modern revelation on it, but this understanding that they knew the plan of salvation before they ever left the Garden of Eden, that they made conscious choices. I think you have to be careful, right? Because it's not, they are of, um, they have a certain level of learning and understanding at their stage. They are not ignorant because they're innocent. I do think though that they don't have experiential learning. You know, we've been talking on Gather lately about this idea of deep learning and that you need experience, even hard experiences to really learn something deeply. I think that's what Adam and Eve need as well. So even though they have an understanding of the plan of salvation, it's not till they actually go and live it <laughs> that they'll really get it. But they have enough understanding to take that next leap forward. The same way you probably had just enough faith to take that leap and get married or to take that leap and have your first kid. Like you don't understand fully what you're walking into, but you know it's good. And that's that's where Adam and Eve were. In addition to all those things, laws, choices, knowledge, the last thing they have is a power to choose. He basically says to them, choose for thyself. You don't really see that in any other commandment anywhere. <laughs> he basically says to them, I'm giving you these choices they have compound connections. Remember, we just talked about this, this idea of like there's hard and good that comes with both of them, but the good I want for you requires this one. And I think they came to an understanding of that over time and they chose it. They chose. That's why when we talk about the fall happening, that it is a fall forward, not just down. You know, in the past, we've talked a lot. In fact, we did some object lessons about this idea of it being like a ski jump, that this fall is like you had to start up high at this one level of glory and you have to fall to another level of glory so that you can experience all the hard. You need that momentum and that gravity, but it also propels you forward into God's plan. And that's what Adam and Eve found as well, that they were willing to make that leap of faith, to trust that there would be a way that they could return home. And that's why it's so powerful to me that they learn all about the Savior while they're still in the garden, that they understand who he is and the gift that he will offer so that they can experience all they need to experience, become closer to God, and then come home only through the gifts and grace and merits of their Savior. Then they find their way home. And I just think you could learn boatloads. There's just great quotes in the notes. I know we're just skimming the surface today, but there's so much more to learn. So I, I hope you get into this chapter two, especially the end of chapter two. I just think it's rich with application for us. The sixth spark I call the long drive out. Because I really love that one verse that talks about them being driven out of the Garden of Eden. It doesn't sound like a verse you should love, but I have come to really love it. This is 2 Nephi 2, 19. And after Adam and Eve had partaken of the forbidden fruit, they were driven out of the Garden of Eden to till the earth. I found myself curious about the abruptness of that verse. I think sometimes we see that so fast. You know, we see them making this choice to partake of the fruit and then being pushed out. You know, initially when I used to read this verse, I, I almost pictured them being like forced out of the garden. It's not until I went to the temple and studied the scriptures more deeply that I came to appreciate how much happens in between. I just think 
their drive out is different. I heard my friend Mindy, this is a long time ago, years ago. She's the one who wrote the book, Eve and Adam. She talked about this idea of being driven out. I think it was on this podcast that I heard. It might also be in her book, but she talked about that drive being almost like the drive when you drive your kids to the MTC or you drive your kids to college. You know, like, you know, they're ready for that next step, but you all, you have all these fears and you're trying to cram as much knowledge and understanding into those miles as you can before you drop them off. That's sort of how I picture them being driven out now. Not that I think they were literally like driven somewhere, but I do think you have to pay attention to how many beautiful gifts they were given before they left, before they headed into this next new phase of opposition and joy and the good and the bad, right? Before that, there's all these gifts. So for example, they learn about the redemption of the Savior. They learn very clearly before they ever have to leave the garden that a Savior will be given, that he will sacrifice and they will be able to come home. They're also sealed together as a couple. They have each other before they leave the garden. We know they're sealed in the garden. So they have that bond and that closeness to rely on before they are driven out. I also love that they receive an education. We don't know how much, but like if you read Elder Holland's words, this idea of them being prepared makes sense, right? That they were in some way prepared. I don't know how long they're in the garden, you guys. It could have been a very, very long time. But I love this idea of them receiving an understanding before they go. The same way you're probably trying to help your kid be ready for a mission or be ready for college before they go. But nothing you can say will actually prepare them for a mission. <laughs> no matter how many times you talk about that missions are hard and missions are good, you know, it doesn't matter what you tell them. What they have to do is experience it for themselves to really understand what you were saying. And I think that's the same thing applies to Adam and Eve. I also love that they're given promises, that they'll receive guidance. They're, they're not going to be on their own there. They'll, they'll have teachers to guide them. They're given clothing. You know, in the Pearl of Great Price, we learned that they're given coats of skins. To me, that's just this beautiful, constant reminder that they can look down and say, the Garden of Eden is real. <laughs> you know, like, even though they had to pass through this veil and they had to separate they have this gift on them that they can constantly look at and say, he loves us. He's caring for us. We're here on purpose. I just think having those coats of skins is such a sweet gift. And they're given them before they're ever driven out. It's almost like you can see your heavenly parents like packing their bags as they head off to college. That's what I feel. I think the biggest thing is they're commanded to have children because I think Heavenly Father knows that one of the quickest ways to come close to him and to understand his reasoning for having them go out of the Garden of Eden is for them to be parents themselves. Don't you think? Like, I just, that's what helps you understand Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother in vastly new ways by being a parent yourself. And so I think that command is a sweet one. I also love that they're given agency. To me, this is, this is the mark of God's trust in them, his hope and confidence that they can make this, that they've been prepared and they're ready. The same way when you finally do drop off your kid at the MDC or at college and you pull away the other direction, it is not because you don't love them. It's because you have confidence that they can make it. It's going to be hard. They're going to learn a lot. They'll make a lot of mistakes, but they're going to make it back home. That's the confidence I had when I dropped off my kids. I think it's the confidence our heavenly parents had in us as well. At least you see it in Adam and Eve's story. So I feel like we can trust that it's part of ours as well. Okay, our final spark, I call motives matter. Because at the very end of Lehi's beautiful sermon to his family, he talks about his motives and how they just come from one pure source. In fact, he says Nephi's motives are the same and that Heavenly Father's motives are the same. You get that all throughout his writings, that they all come from this place of love and that they want, like this is their team and they want them to be successful. So if you look at the very end of chapter two, he says in 28, and now my sons, I would that you should look to the great mediator and hearken unto his great commandments and be faithful unto his words and choose eternal life according to the will of his Holy Spirit. It's almost like you can see him pointing at that tree. You know, he's saying, I, it's not me. I am the prophet. I'm here to guide you. But what I do as a prophet is I direct you to the tree. I am that rod that takes you to the tree. This is his gospel and his words and his promises. Focus your eyes there. I also love what you see in 30. I have spoken these few words unto you all, my sons, in the last days of my probation. And I have chosen the good part, according to the words of the prophet. And I have none other object save it be the everlasting welfare of your souls. Amen. This is Lehi helping them understand that he has no ulterior motive. There's no agenda. There's, he's not hoping for anything other than he just wants them to get back home. And he wants them to get back home as mighty men of God. 
the reason I like this so much is I think that's what our prophets and apostles still do today, over and over again today. In fact, I was reading recently a book. It's from Sherry Dew. It's called Prophets See Around Corners. And I was teaching some of the principles in it to my YSA class. And I honestly, I loved her way of phrasing it. She basically said, can you think of 15 men on the planet that have purer motives than the 15 prophets, seers, and revelators that we have? Like they have no agenda. They're not hoping for popularity. They don't earn any money. They don't have any desire other than to help you get closer to Christ so that you can access the gifts of salvation and exaltation that are at your fingertips if you choose it. They have no other motive. And I just think that's what we want to get across when we testify about prophets and apostles. They are mighty men of God who focus our eyes on that tree and over and over again tell us how good it tastes and why it's worth it. And there was this great talk I came across this from President Packer back in the 80s, and he was talking about agency. And I loved his stance. He basically said, Latter-day Saints are not obedient because they are compelled to be obedient. They are obedient because they know certain truths and have decided as an expression of their own individual agency to obey the commandments of God. And then towards the end, he says, we are not obedient because we are blind. We are obedient because we can see. That's how I feel when I read Lehi's words, because he basically says to them that same message. I have lived this probationary state. I've been given this beautiful life where I've been given breath to breathe and a heart that pumps and all the gifts, right? I've been given all these things so that I have this probationary state and I can choose every day of my life to come closer to Christ or to recede. And I'm telling you right now at the end of my life, I have chosen that good part. He is testifying so strongly to his sons and their wives and their posterity. At the end of my life, here's what you pick. This is what matters most. The same way if you listen to end of life discussions from people today, they often talk about family. They talk about coming closer to God. They never talk about things they wish they would have done with their work or how much money they would have earned. Like this is Lehi at the end of his life saying, I have, I have experienced this probationary state, this time to come unto God. And I'm telling you, it's worth it. It's this good part. And I hope you grab, grab hold of it. All right, you guys, you ready for some good questions? This is when I give you five questions that just popped into my mind or insights that I found as I was studying that I'm hoping to use to like tether you to your scriptures so that you'll jump into them and start seeking and searching or just having maybe more meaningful conversations throughout your week. But let me give you a few to get you started. First, this first question comes from that very beginning part of the chapter. This is when Lehi talks about the land of promise, that they've been given this land in order to have a place of security and freedom and safety, that they won't be in bondage, all those things. Then he also tells them what the Lord requires of them, that they need to honor him. They need to use, have him be their God. That means they have to keep his commandments in order to receive those blessings. And I loved all of that. But I think what I loved most was seeing the connection points between the land of promise and agency. I guess I just had never tied those two together in my head. I always thought about the land of promise being like this place that has like bounteous crops and freedom and safety and all those things. But I think it's really interesting to think about the land of promise and how it ties to this gift of agency, this penultimate gift that the Savior offers us. I'm curious about your thoughts. Where do you see connection points between agency, this gift of moral agency, and the land of promise? Where do you see them connect? Okay, second question. This comes from like verse 15 of chapter one. This is when Lehi talks about being encircled. Remember how we said this in the insights, this idea of how he has this confidence in Christ where he feels like even now, before he passes through the veil, he feels that he is encircled in the arms of his love. And I just feel like this is something we've heard so frequently lately from our prophets and apostles, this idea of God's love, what it feels like, how pervasive it is. I love Elder Danes, this last conference, how he talked about covenants are the shape of God's embrace. There's something about that encircling that intrigues me. I just think you hear it often throughout scripture, not just with this phrase, but like, you know, a crown of righteousness is a circle, a robe that wraps around someone in circles. A, a divine embrace is that same phrase. I guess my hope is that you'll go through the last few conferences and seek out your favorite quote that talks about God's love. And my hope is that you'll share it. Um, I, I think there's a lot out there, especially lately, about what God's love looks like and feels like and how prevalent it is. And I, I guess I'm hoping that we can just fill the feed with quotes about what you've come to understand about God's love through the words of prophets and apostles. So that's question two. 
All right. My next question is one you've probably bounced around your mind in the past, but I'm hoping to give you a, an opportunity to get into these verses and seek for an answer. So the question that kept coming to mind is, why does Satan play for God's team in this way? In the verses this week, especially in chapter two, you learn that Lehi has been studying the scriptures and he comes to understand more of the origin story of the adversary, that he is someone who rebelled against God. He didn't have an alternate plan. He rebelled against God's plan, this idea of agency. He pushed against it, rebelled against it, and then is cast out. And then it almost seems odd because of what we teach about the fall, right? We teach that the fall was intentional, that's part of God's plan, that it's a glorious thing. But at the same time, it seems weird that Satan plays a role in it, almost like he's advancing God's plan by enticing Eve to partake of the fruit. And I guess my question is, why? You know, why do you think this happens? I don't want to speculate. My goal here is not to kind of like pull up a whole lot of weird. My hope is that you'll actually get into these verses and see what Lehi teaches. Because I actually found some sweet answers this week to that question. I've wondered that in the past, and I found some interesting answers as I studied Lehi's words, especially as I studied them in conjunction with the words of our modern day prophets and apostles. This is a good one to go into the notes if you don't know the answer to this. I don't know that I know the answer, but I definitely got more insight and understanding as I studied Lehi's words. So I'm curious to see what you guys think. So my question is, we know the fall was a part of God's plan. Why did Satan seem to further God's plan when he enticed Eve to partake of the fruit? Okay, fourth question. Lots of people in the history of time have condemned Eve and even women as a whole for her role in the fall. Modern revelation teaches us obviously that that is not the case and that we revere Eve for her choice. I do think it's, you know, she's still in a state of innocence and there still is beguiling happening. I don't think we have to build it up too much, but I do think we have to appreciate the bravery of her choice and Adam's choice. I love what we learned in the Doctrine and Covenants. Do you remember when we learned about, was it Joseph F. Smith and he sees that vision of heaven. In fact, I wrote it down so I don't misquote him. It says, President Joseph F. Smith saw the great and mighty ones assembled to meet the Son of God, and among them, he said, was our glorious mother Eve. So I guess my question is, in these verses or in teachings that you've learned from modern prophets and apostles, where do you see this reinforced? What helps you understand why Adam and Eve deserve our reverence and our honor and our you know, delight when we speak about their story? what helps you there? Okay, last question. Lehi taught that men are free according to the flesh, free to choose. They're free to choose liberty or captivity. Remember that epic verse? And there's this great talk from Elder Christofferson where he he talks about this compared to our day, that we have we live in a world of moral relativism, <laughs> you know, where people like to believe that you can, there are no laws and there is no, you can, everybody can make their own truth. And it gets really murky, I think, especially for our teenagers who are trying to navigate this world, and they naturally have these hearts that are full of compassion, and they want they want to be compassionate, and it's hard. I, I, let me give you a snippet of his quote, and then I'll ask you my question. He says, misunderstanding God's justice and mercy is one thing. Denying God's existence or supremacy is another. But either will result in our achieving less, something far less than our full divine potential. A God who makes no demands is the functional equivalent of a God who does not exist. A world without God, without the living God who establishes moral laws to govern and perfect his children, is also a world without ultimate truth or justice. It is a world where moral relativism reigns supreme. Relativism means just that each person is his or her own highest authority. So my question is, where do you see this today? And frankly, what I really want to know is how do you help guard your kids against it? How do you teach them truth the same way that Lehi taught his sons truth and helped them understand the plan? Where, what have you found helps your kids understand that laws are real, that God is real, that the promises are real? Where do you go? Where do you point them? Where do you see moral relativism in our society today? And how do you teach your kids to understand it more fully? We're going to head into the object lessons next, but before we go, I just wanted to put one more bright light on the truth that Lehi offers, that this life is about joy. <laughs> I love the way it's phrased. If you go in 2 Nephi 2, this is 24 and 25. This is where you see that, you know, it's all things are done in wisdom, in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. <laughs> and then he talks about what God knows, that his whole purpose, Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. Joseph Smith echoes this too. He talks about happiness being the object and design of our existence. And I love, there's this great talk. It's in the notes. It's from Elder Goslin from 
it's in the eighties. I think it's on, on, on happiness. And he talked about how happiness is not this reward that we get at the end. You know, kind of the same way we talked about with the tree of life. It's not this reward we get at the end. It's, it's something that is a consequence of living God's laws now today. Like it is not something we are waiting for. It's what you experience now, which is why I think President Nelson is focusing so much on how do you live now? It will feel like that, but better down the road. And I just loved his emphasis. So in this talk, this is, this is how he ends. Our yearnings for happiness were implanted in our hearts by deity. They represent a kind of homesickness for we have a residual memory of our pre-mortal existence. They are a foretaste of the fullness of joy that is promised to the faithful. We can expect with perfect faith that our father will fulfill our inmost longings for joy. Our joy in God's kingdom will be the natural extension of the happiness we cultivate in this life. That's what I felt as I read Lehi's words this week. He is someone who has lived a rich, full, hard life. And he says, of all the things that matter most, let me teach you about agency. Let me teach you about the goodness of God. Let me teach you about why he set things up the way he did. All of this is designed to give you the happiness you so desperately seek. And then he invites us to come and find it. I just think you're going to love this week's study. Mm -hmm.